I remember plugging in our first engine, the Crucible, the one of a, one of the first like interstellar engines that we like rated engines that we put uh, in the game, and it didn't fit in the VAB <laughs> as one part, <laughs> and that's just the engine. This is the only game where you travel continuously from multi-light year stars all the way down to the surface of an orbital body with sub-millimeter precision. This scale is so phenomenally different than any other game out there. Everything in this game is way, way bigger. Not just a little bit bigger, not two times bigger, the human mind is not designed to even comprehend the distances we're talking about here. Interplanetary travel is like sitting on the Earth and trying to aim a bow and arrow and hit the moon. Interstellar travel is like trying to hit a grape on the surface of the moon. Very early in the development of KSP-2, we understood that we wanted to have interstellar travel. You look at a map of the local area of the galaxy, and you see, like in the real world, closest star is about four light years away. You have no idea how far a light year actually is. This is one of the profound lessons that this game is going to teach to you. Once you have braved all of the challenges of the Kerbolar system, you will now be able to build a sort of arc and carry it to an entirely new star, build a fresh new KSC, and you will have an entire new set of planets to play with. We have a little more liberty as we get away from the Kerbolar system to get a little more weird with it. And we are providing a window into how do those worlds look. The things I've seen in some of these uh, show and tell meetings that the environment team is cooking up, it's it blew my mind when I saw it. Just being able to look out over a horizon that was completely alien to me, that was something outside of my experience, and yet when I looked at it, I could say, that looks like a real place. It was eye-opening. You're gonna be sitting on the surface of a planet and you're gonna see a little speck of light off in the distance that's only gonna be like a pixel. But that's a star, and that's something you can actually go and visit in the game. And it's going to be fully simulated from point A to point B, from departure to touchdown at, at your destination. That's, I don't think, ever been done before in any game. Paul Gilster wrote a book called Centauri Dreams. And it is a survey book of every idea anyone ever had as far as getting to another star. I was a little nervous to talk to him the first time that we spoke. Are you aware of Kerbal Space Program? Have you heard it talked about before? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I know all about what you guys are involved with, and I love it. I just think it's terrific. Um, so I'm very familiar with Kerbal. Your name was the first thing that popped into my head when we were asking around, like, who should we talk to about this? So I really appreciate sure. having written that. Well, I appreciate those kind words, and I'm, I'm glad to help in any way I can, sure. sure. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask you a, a few sort of general questions, sort of I, ha, your book and to some extent your blog uh, are, are kind of um, my most recent exposure to current thinking on the subject, on the sort of state of the art of this question. Right. Um, but the first question I wanted to ask you, when people ask you, why should we do this? What is your answer? I get asked that a lot. You know, we're not talking about taking arcs full of uh, a million people uh, to another star. Uh, there's no reason. Uh, really, I think that it's just going to happen because explorers are going to want to go. It's in our DNA at some level that some of us will do it. It's really hard for us on Earth to grasp what the distance between stars is like and what that environment is like. There's no light, there's no oxygen. People often compare it to maybe sailing across the Pacific Ocean in a sailing ship, but it's far worse than that. It's far longer, it's far more inhospitable. And if you're ever gonna try to cross that, we're gonna need to marshal our entire civilization's resources. There's gonna be so much international cooperation, cutting edge technology development, 
cutting edge engineering, everything that we use to go on that mission will need to be developed, well, not from scratch, but as a very significant delta to our current technologies. And that's really exciting and has the potential to impact so many areas of humanity. And that is, that's cool. It is incredibly impractical for us to directly go visit another star system, just because of the sheer amount of time it takes even light to get there. There are definitely solutions that involve generational ships or, you know, very efficient fuel sources over long periods of time, but this is a leap. This is a different setup. To me, the most uh, compelling reason to, to make KSP-2 interstellar was to create uh, unknown regions for exploration. The Kerbola system is a known quantity. We can't think of anything more exciting than the unknown. And we think discovery as an impetus for flight um, is maybe the strongest possible driving force. You are traveling through deep space where you are just going. It goes for like days, weeks, potentially months. And you've got a little, uh, without a whiteboard, it's going to be a little confusing to explain. Fun fact, I originally, when I was a child, wanted to be an architect. And then I learned you had to know how to draw to be an architect. So I decided I didn't want to be an architect. I'm going to go into game design. Now look at me. The distance between your target and you is so absurdly huge compared to those intercept burns. You are basically trying to thread a needle from 10,000 kilometers. I hope that when players are traveling these interstellar distances, they really uh, get a sense for that vastness of space. I want them to feel cold and alone. There has been a need to overhaul the maneuvering system so that we can depict the behavior of vehicles that are burning for long periods of time. You're tiptoeing into something called brachistochrone trajectories. They kind of look like unfurling spirals. You can see this is where your vehicle will be over the course of a given burn, and then it will coast. You also need to be able to plan a deceleration burn at the other end so that ultimately you can intercept a star. We also have what is called torch ship engines which are not necessarily optimized for interstellar travel, but are very, very good for getting to another place inside a solar system very, very quickly. It's often less efficient, but it is really cool. Uh, so, so this new uh, maneuvering system kind of serves both purposes. Dr. Michael Dodd uh, has spent a lot of time thinking about how to visually represent those kinds of trajectories and also how to get them on rails so that you can time warp. One of the major challenges of playing KSP-1, you'd start a burn and then you could like go eat a meal and then come back and you'd still be doing the burn. In KSP-2, because it's so important to be able to burn for very long periods of time, we had to completely overhaul the system so that you can time warp while burning. So that's all work that Dr. Dodd was, was critical to. The level of precision required is astronomically larger. It's so much harder to plan a trajectory that's going to intercept another star than it is to, say, intercept the moon. We're working on completely redesigning the UI and UX system to make this experience like seamless for the player and also kind of intuitive. If you successfully navigate launching a rocket into space for the first time, traveling to the moon for the first time, interstellar is not going to be that much more complicated. It's just a, a moon, but it's really, really far away. There's a kind of vehicle you can build in KSP-1, and it's called a Grand Tour Vehicle. You try to make a vehicle that can visit every destination in the Kerbola system. You can now make proper Grand Tour Plus vehicles, functionally motherships, massive interstellar vehicles that are then appointed with a bunch of other smaller vehicles the purpose of which is to conduct excursions when you arrive at the target star system. A huge long truss, gigantic inertial confinement fusion engine, and then winged vehicles for exploring planets with atmospheres. We want 
your vessels to perform roughly how you would expect based on on your experience with KSP-1. But under the hood, we are making numerous improvements to that experience to make it more performant, more robust, and allow for the scale and scope of vessels that like that we have here and, and allow them to be built without the Kraken getting you. We're killing the Kraken. That is a hell of a claim to make. But you can edit it out. Our ultimate goal is to slay the Kraken. But on top of that, you're gonna want to pack some stuff, more than just like your average science module or some snacks. You are building ships that are ferrying an entire colony from uh, the Kerbin system to stars beyond. Are you good to put that there? Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. You know what, it's actually fine right there. Is it better over here? See what I have to work with here? Are we good? Yeah, you're good. Okay. <laughs> Again, you see what I have to work with. <laughs> Hi, Nate. What's it like working with that guy? He's a character. <laughs> no, he's a uh, he's. He's very passionate about, about this project, and, and it's something I, I deeply respect. When we got the opportunity to work on this, Nate specifically stepped up and says, uh, I've put a couple thousand hours into this game. This game is my life, and this will be, <laughs> this will be my opus. And I believed him. A lot of people play this game because they want to be able to experience a, a physics simulation and make mistakes and without repercussion. And Kerbal not only encourages that, but makes it viable by having these worlds that are interesting to explore and it's forgiving, but it's also a really challenging game. And getting the physics right is an extremely difficult technical problem. I'm also really excited for players to uh, hit their first moment as they kind of bump up against the far reaches of the Kerbolar system. And they have a vessel that is ready to reach the nearest star. And they zoom out and they reach beyond those borders and they see, oh, I've been here for this long. And so much of my journey and so much of my story has been here. And now it's out here. <laughs> we can't take everyone up into space and just like make them look out the window, but we can give them a simulation of that. And my hope is that if we do that enough with enough people, that that can change the course of things. There's this great photo of Michael Collins orbiting on the command module on Apollo just after the undocking of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. Earth is in the background. There's this comment that everyone who has ever lived or ever died, with the exception of Michael Collins, is in this photo. If people get into orbit, get to a faraway planet in our game, and are able to think about the scope and scale and say, Man, there's bigger problems that we should be solving, as silly as they may be, perhaps like the Kerbal sometimes. But if we could come together and solve some of those big problems and have a really big vision and achieve it, I think that's something we could all stand to take away from it.